The Faith at Work movement is on a cusp, destined for great things. God uses people from all kinds of walks of life and all kinds of professions to advance His kingdom. Work is a crucible that God uses to refine us. Everybody's work matters to God. The only thing that really brings lasting change is the gospel of Jesus Christ applied to every area of life. Leadership is people who can take other people's pain and turn it into passion. Are you overwhelmed by Jesus Christ? Dorothy Sayers' first job was in advertising, and as perhaps you picked up, so was mine. So you can trust every word you hear from me this afternoon. <laughs> and indeed, every picture you see. <laughs> Sayers was one of the most extraordinary women British women of the 20th century. She was a quite brilliant copywriter whose campaign idea for Guinness beer that she created in the 1920s is still being used today. She was also a groundbreaking, genre-changing detective story writer whose 15 Lord Peter Whimsey novels are also still in print today, 70 years after the last one was actually published. Born as she was in 1893, by 1942, Dorothy L. Sayers was probably the most famous avowedly Christian woman in Britain. The broadcasting of her plays about the life of Christ, the man born to be king, caused a national storm. Her portrait of Jesus was not only theologically extraordinarily astute, but it gave the public their first taste of a down-to-earth Jesus and a rather complex Judas, hugely controversial back then. Here then was a giant in her own time, a household name as well as an ecclesiastical star. She was one of a quartet of formidable Christian public communicators. There was Sayers, there was C.S. Lewis, there was T.S. Eliot, and there was Charles Williams. And she was the only one to be offered an honorary doctorate by the Archbishop of Canterbury. Sayers was also the greatest champion for workplace ministry that our nation has ever had. Now, work was a theme in much of her fiction, but she explored it directly in essays many of you will be familiar with, like Why Work? And then in her play, Zeal for Thy House, it took center stage. This came out in 1937, and it's the story of the rebuilding of Canterbury Cathedral in the 14th century after a fire. And the, the play revolves around this question. Would you rather have an impious, hugely immoral architect, who's a fantastic architect, or a pious, moral architect whose work is second rate? Well, perhaps the answer is obvious to you now, but not necessarily then. And her answer was unequivocally clear. Bad work could never be justified because it was done by a Christian. If you need a brain surgeon, might I suggest to you that uh, their skill is rather more important to you than their faith. Work, she said, and let's listen to her a little bit. Work, she said, must be good work before it can be called God's work. No crooked table legs or ill-fitting drawers ever, I dare swear, came out of the carpenter shop at Nazareth. Indeed, she saw good work as actually essential to faithful discipleship. The church's approach, and here she is again, the church's approach to an intelligent carpenter is usually confined to exhorting him not to be drunk and disorderly in his leisure hours or even in his leisure hours. And to come to church, and I'm so culturally sensitive, aren't I? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, particularly given that you're all rebels. But, um. I better start this quote again, hadn't I? <laughs> the church's approach to an intelligent carpenter is usually confined to exhorting him not to be drunk and disorderly in his leisure hours and to come to church on Sundays. What the church should be telling him is this, that the very first 
demand that his religion makes upon him is that he should make good tables. So work matters in itself. Not work as a platform for evangelism, not work as a means to generate funds for church-based initiatives, not work as a context to display godly character, not work as a battleground for truth and justice and equality, but work as work. The pipe laid, the meal cooked, the algorithm written, the customer served. As she said, Work should, in fact, be thought of as a creative activity undertaken for the love of the work itself. And man, made in God's image, should make things as God makes them for the sake of doing well a thing that is well worth doing. Now, in Sayer's view, the church's failure to uh, teach the biblical truth about work, not only diminished discipleship, but tragically limited the, the appeal of the gospel to non-believers. Again, listen to her. In nothing has the church so lost her hold on reality as her failure to understand and respect the secular vocation she has allowed work and religion to become separate departments and is astonished to find that as a result, the secular work of the world is turned to purely selfish and destructive ends and that the greater part of the world's intelligent workers have become irreligious or at least uninterested in religion. But is it astonishing, she asks, how can anyone remain interested in a religion which seems to have no concern with nine-tenths of their life? Her point here is not just about work, is it? Her point is about the gospel, and it applies today. The failure to teach work well is part of a wider failure to offer a whole life gospel to non-believers. No wonder people are not gripped by Christianity. The gospel we present rarely includes any compelling vision for the transformation of ordinary daily life. Now, Sayer's uh, most original theological contribution came in The Mind of the Maker, published in 1941. And her contention was this. The first and most obvious thing that uh, we learn about God in Genesis 1 is that he is creator worker. And so if we want to understand God, we must understand him also as creator. And then when we come to the revelation in Genesis chapter 1 that humans are created in the image of God, well, the first and most obvious application of that is that we are created in the image of a creator worker God. Now, the concept of God as creator has perhaps been much less explored than other concepts like God as father. When we think of exploring the idea of God as father, we, we bring personal experience and biblical revelation to bear. How does our picture of a good earthly father shape our understanding of what a good heavenly father might look like? And more pertinently, how does what we read in the Bible, what we see in the Bible about God as father shape both our understanding of him and also our understanding of what good parenting ought to look like? Now Sayers brilliantly applies this same framework to God as creator. How does our picture of a good earthly worker shape our understanding of what God, how God works, and how does the way we see God working not only shape our understanding of him, but also our understanding of how we also then ought to work. Now Sayers sees, obviously, that God is Trinity. The Father creates by the Son through the Spirit, but she goes further. And what she suggests by using her own work as a writer as an example is that the human creative process is essentially Trinitarian. So, for example, there is the idea for a book, the Father. Then there is, if you like, all the work that goes into the book to turn words into sentences into the whole book. The word made flesh, if you like, the idea made flesh. And then there is the power of the book to have an impact on people. That, if you like, is the spirit. Now, theoretically, you can 
separate the conception of the book from the book itself and the power to have impact, but it's tough to do. They're really all one piece. There is the idea of the car, there is the car, and there is the impact that the car has when it's been built. And here's one I drove earlier. <laughs> God is Trinity, and he works that way. And God has built a Trinitarian process into the way we as creatures made in his image work. So what is potent here is not just a way of thinking about work, but a way of thinking about work that makes the concept of the Trinity something familiar to us in our everyday lives, built into the way we do that most ordinary thing, the way we work. So maybe we can't explain the Trinity, but in the high calling of our daily work, we get a glimpse of how three can be one, and yet three. So I commend Dr. Dorothy L. Sayers to you as an outstanding worker, as a brilliant copywriter, as a fine novelist, as a groundbreaking dramatist, as a vigorous advocate for the gospel of Jesus Christ, as an astute theologian, and as a workplace champion, a woman whose writing continues to bring much pleasure to millions of people and to appoint us to the vital nature of work to our discipleship, the central importance of work to the evangelization of the nations, and to a deeper appreciation of the beauty of the triune God we are so privileged to serve. Sayers was ahead of her time, and she is ahead of ours. And so today we don't just celebrate the foundations that she has laid for us. We give thanks to God for the stairways she crafted that we have yet to ascend. Praise God for her.